Jai Jagannath. Thanks uh, for coming. We are studying uh, Bhagavad Gita from uh, my edition. We are using my edition for um, reference. So we were uh, reading chapter 2 and today we read again verse 32 and then we go on from 33 onwards. Yadrichaya Chapatanam Svarga Dvaramapadritam Sukhinaksha Triyaparta Labhante Yudham Idrisham Osana Prita, happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such opportunity comes unsought. For a warrior engaging in such a battle is like having the do doors of heaven open in front of him. Last time uh, we discussed how this uh, Dharma Yudha, of uh, which uh, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, talking, has nothing to do with the holy war of um, the Abrahamic ideologies. It's not a, a jihad, it's not a crusade, it's not a, a, you know, imperialistic uh, conquest uh, uh, to make, a, you know, a centralized government and to impose a particular culture. Uh, here, Dharma doesn't mean religion. In fact, dharma does not mean religion. <laughs> it means uh, um, the uh, natural principles of ethics. You know, what is good and what is bad. So the Yudha Dharma is uh, only to protect oneself and to protect one's uh, dependence, the prajas. So, a Yudha Dharma is not going around uh, and, uh, and killing innocent people. So, let's go to the next verse. Let's make it a little bit bigger, so, because my eyesight is not so good anymore. Atha chetamimam dharmyam sangramam nakarishyasi tathasva dharmam kirtimcha Hitva Papa Mavapsi. See, therefore, if you do not engage in this dharmic action, you will lose your good name of Kshatriya. What will you obtain is Papa. Papa is also another uh, word that we have to be very careful in, in translating. Uh, in fact, we should not uh, translate it. There are many terms in uh, in Sanskrit that cannot be translated in English because the what we think is the equivalent in English is actually carrying a lot of uh, very different semantic luggage. Uh, in uh, Abrahamic cultures, Papam is a disobedience to God. A disobedience to God and to those who speak in the name of God. Uh, this has nothing to do with the, with the Vedic system, with Hinduism, with Bhagavad Gita. There is no uh, preacher or prophet here telling that people in, you know, on the battlefield to Arjuna that Arjuna, you have to fight for God. Fight for me. I am the prophet of God. I am God and I'm telling you that you have to fight for me. No, that's... <laughs> Uh, that's not the point. Um, Papam means uh, causing damage or suffering to innocent and good people. Papam is a bad action. Let's see here um, in other uh, in other. Uh, uh, commentaries we have I have uh, um, elaborate on the different uh, uh, types of negative action and with the uh, specific definitions so rather here I'm explaining um, word Papa is often translated as sin but its meaning is quite different from its counterpart in the Abrahamic religions that do not accept the idea of reincarnation 
rather than a transgression against God's order, orders that constitute sin in the Brahmin uh, faith. Papa is the karmic burden of a selfish choice that goes against the basic ethical principles, dharma, that support the universe. It is a failure, a symptom of imperfection, a stain on one's character, a contamination, but it doesn't condemn the individual to eternal hell. So this is important because uh, sometimes people make uh, a lot of confusion. Other um, terms that are uh, confusing uh, in their uh, English translation, you know, so some, some bad English translation, for example, the word uh, Murti or Vigraha is sometimes translated as idol. Unfortunately, the people who use this English word, uh, <laughs> are, you know, th they don't know what uh, the semantic language of, of the word is. They don't know that idol is always a negative term. It means false god. So, you know, whenever we find uh, Hindus, uh, devout Hindus who speak of the idol that they are worshipping, they are just, you know, uh, making fools of themselves and making more damage than, than good. Uh, also, other terms that should not be translated badly into English are, for example, Brahmachari, Sannyasi, Guru, Acharya, uh, Sadaka. Uh, all these things sometimes come out as monk, or uh, uh, celibate, <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, even uh, I've seen uh, the word uh, Acharya translated as pontiff, you know, which is like, ah, my God, they don't know what a pontiff is. But, okay, any questions on this particular verse? Mm, no. No. Okay. So let's carry on. Akirtim chapi bhutani katai shanti tevyam sambhavitasya chakirtim maranat atirichate. Everybody will speak of your infamy forever. For a respectable person, a bad name is worse than death. Why? Because uh, having a bad name prevent, can prevent uh, people from being able to actually do their duty properly. And if uh, we are uh, stopped from performing our duty properly, it's a big damage, not only to us, but to the entire universal community. So... This is, uh, again, we can apply this uh, situation to the problem of birth prejudice uh, that is uh, presented as a caste system. So birth prejudice is a big obstacle to dharma because it prevents people from uh, actually performing their uh, swadharma. And then Swadharma is calculated not based on Jati, but on, based on Guna and Karma, as Krishna will say, um, I think chapter 4, uh, Chaturvarnya Maya Shastam, Guna Karma Vibhagasa, not Jati Vibhagasa, yeah, Guna Karma. So, you know, this is the <laughs> priority of the day according to God's plan. Okay, so next. Bhavad Ranad Uparanam Mamshantitvam Maharataha Yesham Chatvam Bahumato Bhutvaya Shyasi Lagavam The great generals will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear. Those who used to keep you in such a high esteem will not 
take you seriously anymore. So this is confirming what we were saying before. The re real problem of Akirti, bad name, is that people will not take you seriously and you will not be able to do your actual duty. Mm, verse 36. Avacham, <laughs> Avacham, Avacham Adams, sorry. Avacham Adam, uh, Bahum, Vadishyam Tittavahitaha, Nindam Tasva Samartyam Tato, Dukataram Nukim, Tato Dukataram Nukim. Your enemies will circulate many bad rumors about you, offensively, offensively demeaning your valor. What could be more painful for you? This is uh, another uh, uh, point that uh, indicates that one, when uh, once a good name is uh, um, slandered, by enemies, by circulating bad rumors, it is also it is very difficult to do one's duty because, again, people will not take you seriously, people will not listen, and then we'll have problems. Hatova pratyasis vargam jitvava bhokshase bahim Tasma duttista kontaya yudhaya kritanischaya. If you are killed in battle, you will attain the higher planets, and if you win the battle, you will enjoy the pleasures of this world. Therefore, get up, a son of Kunti, and abandoning all doubts, fix your mind on the battle. This is important. Krishna is not telling Arjuna to sit back and fix his mind on chanting the japa, um, you know, or, or um, visualizing uh, uh, the, the Rasa Lila, you know, he is saying, okay, you are on the battlefield, you have to fix your mind on your duty, don't worry, because whatever you do in this life will be valid also for the next. Whatever you do, you are here to do your duty, this is where you come to work. Dharma Kshetra, Kuru Kshetra, this planet is here to, uh, for us to engage in the Dharma Yudha. Uh, now, of course, we cannot uh, do Dharma Yudha 24-7, so we can relax. So when we relax, we are not fighting. Um, of course, we can meditate on... Uh, um, the Rasa Lila, you know, Radha Krishna playing in the Vrindavan, which is a great, of, you know, source of great happiness and, and peace, because this is the eternal reality. But while we are here in this temporary reality, we need to do our work. Uh, in the Vedic system, we have four Varnas and four Ashas. Apart from times of emergency, which are called Apadharma, you know. But uh, when there is no emergency, uh, we should keep a nice part of our day, you know, possibly in the morning when it is, a, you know, be, do, we do our sadhana before, uh, going out uh, <laughs> to the battlefield. You know, we should meditate on the eternal reality that is uh, beyond this temporary world. Then we go out and we engage in the battle in, because it's a temporary battle. All, all battles have a beginning and an end, as Krishna will say. Uh, we need to tolerate the, all the difficulties in life, engaging in this uh, uh, sva dharma, this dharma yuddha, and uh, then when we finish our job, we can relax and you know go back to the 
happy, blissful meditation on uh, the personal relationship with, with Krishna. And uh, what in whatever rasa we, we are, in whatever rasa is uh, um, uniting us in, in meditation with, with God, that is what we should aspire to. Even while we are fighting on the battlefield. But we have to focus on the battle while, while we are fighting. We cannot just be distracted. Otherwise, we will not be able to do our duty properly. We want to make a very good um, you know, performance in our duty, giving all our energy, all our attention, because this is the service we are doing for Krishna. Like for example in the Bhakti Rasabrita Sindhu there is the, the example of uh, Daruka. Daruka is the chariot driver of Krishna in Dwarka. And uh, he is in the Dasaras. His relationship with Krishna is Dasaras. And um, while he was uh, uh, fanning Krishna with the fan, you know, uh, he was uh, so overwhelmed by, by love and devotion that uh, he was uh, weeping. But then he got uh, uh, annoyed because he was weeping. He wanted to st stop weeping because that was interfering with this service. So it's not uh, just uh, about uh, remembering Krishna. You know, a big part of our duty is to actually uh, perform our service in the best possible way. Is this clear? Is there any question about this? Because I think this is an important point. Yeah, this part is clear, but uh, one doubt in this last three, four verses. Please. It talks about infamy and the pleasures of heaven and all those things which are contrary to the essence of Gita, right? Like we should be equanimous in a, a infamy and fame, oh, all those things would come into right, the right. Yes, so. okay, okay, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, um, we have to be very careful um, about uh, the... Um, in a correct understanding, we should be uh, equally disposed uh, in the sense uh, when we actually get them. Like uh, uh, attaining the, the higher planets or pleasures of this world are things that we should be detached from, but they are still uh, the direction in which we are engaging. So there is a difference between um, not uh, pursuing a positive goal and uh, pursuing a positive goal but remaining um, even-minded when we are not getting what we were trying to get. You understand? So it is normal to desire to attain the higher planets or to enjoy the pleasure of this world because this is something that is good for our body and our mind. We don't want to get uh, damage <laughs> and suffering and a bad birth and everything because that is not good for our body and our mind and it is not going to help us do our duty. It is not going to be very helpful. We will not be very helpful to the universal community. What we need to be uh, equally minded about is the fact that we get success or failure. But it's not that we are not striving for success. You see the difference?
we are still uh, yes we yeah. are still striving for success you understand mm -hmm. we are still striving for higher planets and uh, pleasure of this world and the uh, good income <laughs> and a good family happy family a nice house a nice thing because these are artas and kamas there are four purposes of human life dharma artha kama moksha so the dharma is the basis so we want to go to the higher planets and we can go there by dharma not by adharma right <laughs> you know and enjoying the pleasures of this world we uh, consider the dharmic pleasures not the adharmic pleasures we want healthy sattvic pleasures so it is perfectly okay to pursue to pursue all this because it is good for uh, you know to sustain ourselves to sustain and, and keep our mind and body as uh, healthy and functional as possible if we engage in penance <laughs> this penance is another word that is uh, a very bad english word uh bad in the sense that it doesn't mean tapas uh, tapas means focusing and investing energy Penance means torturing one's body. It's a typically Abrahamic, especially Christian concept. Penance means that uh, you, because you hate your body, you hate nature, you hate uh, uh, pleasure. <laughs> so you, you know, you become a masochist. Means that you are actively searching for pain and suffering to in inflict on your body and your mind in order to mortify yourself this is the meaning of penance you know uh, some people in, uh, in you know hinduism has uh, have uh, you know taken up this meaning thinking it's a good idea thinking all oh, the great yogis they do so many austerities and penance you know they uh, sleep on the you know on, on the uh, on a bed of nails you know they uh, keep one hand uh, up until the the, the uh, you know the muscles and the bones and everything are atrophied and they're becoming deformed you cannot use it even if you wanted it you know you ruin your body okay this has nothing to do with sattva in fact it is tamas and rajas it is asuric penance penance in itself is an asuric concept and in fact we we'll see in the chapter when uh, krishna is speaking about the three types of faith you know krishna will say clearly that the, the tapas, the austerities that uh, cause suffering and damage to the body are actually asuric. And we see, you know, what uh, Hiranyakashipu, uh, Hiranyaksha, Ravana, all these asuras were doing, you know, to get uh, uh, special power were not spiritual practices, it was not sadhana. So, you know, it, we need to understand, we need to wash away all the Asuric ideas that people stick to religion. We need to understand the difference between the faith, the, the, the three types of the Shraddha Traya, <laughs> you know, the faith and religion in Sattva, in Rajas, and in Tamas. We want the Sattvic religion. Sattvic religion, Sattvic austerity, Krishna says, the austerities of the body are offering uh, pranam to the better people. You know? 
are uh, engaging, working for the benefit of all beings. These are the austerities of the body. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to damage your body or mind. You know, you know. You just uh, work uh, honestly, work in a good way, in a dutiful way, for the benefit of everyone. So this means that if you attain the higher planets, you will be in a better position, even even best, you know, even better, best position to work for the benefit of all beings. So why not? Why not go into Swarga? It's not a bad idea. Or uh, enjoy the pleasures of this world. You know, as long as they're sattvic pleasures, you eat good food, you have a decent house, why not? Now, of course, it depends on the work you do. Because if you are a sannyasi or a brahmana, so you are uh, um, extremely detached from material sense gratification, and you are giving a good example to the rest of the society, you can still eat reasonably good food. food. You know, you don't need to eat horrible stuff, you know, or to fast completely, you know, but uh, you, it, you know, you, you practice more simplicity, arjavan. So, um, you're less complicated because you have less needs. You are focusing more uh, on uh, the um, subtle uh, and, and, and transcendental level. So, uh, Sannyasi is preparing for death, so he's trying to detach himself from uh, uh, different kinds of luxury and everything. A Kshatriya is in a different, Griyastha Kshatriya is in a different position because he needs to keep his body strong and his mind strong, you know, and satisfied and happy, you know, so you, you cannot have the same diet of a sannyasi. <laughs> you know, a Kshatriya warrior needs to eat uh, um, more, uh, more calories, in a sense, more protein than, than, a, than a sannyasi. Uh, both because of the age and because of the work that uh, he is supposed to do. You understand the difference? Okay. But uh, s still, uh, yes. okay, <laughs> thanks. So, but still, uh, even a, a, a Kshatriya, a Grihastha Kshatriya, you know, who is uh, legitimately pursuing the, you know, uh, very rich food, will not be distracted from his duty if he doesn't get it. You see the difference? You know, equally minded means that, you know, I, I would like to have that, but if I don't get it, okay, I'll do, I, I'll make do with what I get. You understand? So, um, hmm. this, uh, uh, this argument that Krishna is using, if you are killed in battle, you will attain the higher planets. If you win the battle, you will enjoy the pleasures of this world. Why? Arjun should not fight. Of course, Arjuna is not afraid of being killed in battle. And he is not interested in enjoying the pleasures of this world, because he already said it before. You know, he's saying, uh, you know, why, why should we desire the kingdom of the riches of this world when uh, the people, we, uh, you know, our people, our you know, family are going to, to die for that. So definitely Arjuna was not interested in either, you know, higher planets or pleasures of this world. But why then he doesn't want to fight? Ekshadriya is supposed to fight. Here Krishna is speaking about the duty of the Kshatriya. He's speaking about the material duties, religious material duties, in this world. Mm, often people have a you know, confused idea of religion. 
uh, <laughs> especially in Hinduism, because the concept is so vast and deep that people can easily get lost, you know, in, in, the, in the ocean. <laughs> so there are two aspects of religion. One is the social aspect, and the other is the individual aspect. Now, the social aspect of religion is the work that you do, your social duty that you perform as a religious duty to support the community, to support the society, to support the universal community, and this is, in a sense, material, but still it's religious. Still, you, are, you don't have to do it to get a, a benefit. You can still be selfless. So this aspect of material religiosity is not to be condemned because it's also service to God. But it is um, applied by performing one's uh, uh, professional duties, uh, family duties, and social duties. Like, for example, the Vedas and Hitas, with all the, the uh, Vedic hymns, are part of these social religious duties. So there are differences due to the Varnas, because the religious duty the social religious duty of a Brahmana is different from the social religious duty of a Shudra or the Vaishya, the Chatra, whatever. This is a social part. Then we have the individual part, which is a spiritual, transcendental part that is we, we can define as uh, devotion. While the Vedic hymns are um, addressing the material manifestations of God, the devas, you know, Indra and, and all the others, the um, personal, individual, transcendental, devotional, uh, religious uh, activities or sadhana are focused on developing an individual personal relationship with God that completely go beyond, uh, goes beyond uh, the Varnas and the Ashramas. So it's transcendental. This is why they said that Bhakti is Ahaitukya Pratihata, is Sanatana Dharma, is something that has uh, no conditions. It is called unconditional devotion because it doesn't matter, you know, kiba vipra, kiba nyasi, shudra kene hai. It's, uh, it's irrelevant. Whichever position you have in society, whatever rituals, social rituals you do or you don't do, it doesn't matter because our personal relationship with God is internal. It's not a social activity. This is why it's so wrong when uh, the, the Bhakti movements oops, when the Bhakti movements become social opportunities. You know, the, instead of cultivating the actual personal relationship of the, of the devotee to God, they uh, become, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a matter of social position. So it is. It is clear. I, I hope it is clear. Yes. Okay. Any any further question on this? Because it, this is important to to. Separate uh, the, the, the Vedas and Hitas from the um, concept of Bhakti, Tantra, Yoga, etc., which is complementary but it doesn't depend on the Vedas and Hitas. Okay. Yes. Okay, good, good. 
Any other question? No, we can continue. Okay, so we continue. Very good. Then we go. Suka duke samekri tva labhala bhoja yajayo tato yudhaya yudjasva naivam papam babapsesi. And this is uh, what we were saying before. If you fight this battle while remaining equally disposed, uh, means unattached and prepared, to joy and sadness, gain and loss, victory and defeat, you will never be touched by sin. But you still have to fight the battle trying to win. <laughs> it's not that you sit on the battle, you don't care if you win or you lose, so you don't do anything. You see the difference? You know, it, it, it's not that you uh, fight uh, the battle without uh, taking it seriously. Because who cares? I don't care if I win or if I lose. No, no. <laughs> you care. In, in the sense that you have to do your duty in the best possible way, and that means you have to try to win, right? So, but we are equally disposed means, okay, I win, yes, great. I lose, okay, well, I learned something, you know? <laughs> so, there is a, a new age of saying, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Because, you know, also another very famous saying is that uh, uh, defeat, defeat is the pillar of success. You know, failure. Failure is the pillar of success. Because when we fail, we learn. So next time we are um, doing better. So we know that life is a school, you know. All these tests we are getting are not important in themselves, but their purpose is to make us better people, you know, to, to help us evolve and become more uh, qualified, more uh, realized, more... Uh, perfect in a sense as much as you know we can be perfect in the material world so th is this clear now yes perfect and we go huh. okay hmm esote bihita sankhe buddhir yoga twimam shrinu buddhya yukto yaya partha Karma Bandham Prahasyasi. I have explained this point to you by the analytical method of examination called Sankhya. Now listen to this concept as observed from the perspective of the practice of intelligence called Buddhi Yoga. Oparta, through this Buddhi Yoga, which is the application of intelligence and correct understanding, you will be released from the bondage of karma, actions and reactions. So where is the chapter of Bhagavad Gita that is entitled Buddha Yoga? It's not there. <laughs> the next chapter is called Karma Yoga. Why? Because the Buddha Yoga should apply to all the other teachings of Krishna in the Gita. Karma Yoga, uh, dhyana yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, uh, moksha yoga, moksha yoga, uh, all these forms of yoga, all these approaches of perspectives of yoga are all buddhi yoga because we need to understand them properly. So without buddhi, we are not going anywhere. Okay, so next. Neha bikaman nasusti pratyaya yo navidyate pratyavayo perdon pratyavayo navidyate svalpa ma pyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat this also is an important verse because he say even a little done in the direction of this dharma liberates one from the greatest fear svalpa maya pyasya 
Svalpam api asya dharmasya. Okay, on this path, no effort goes to loss. And there is no failure, no harm. Uh, nasa asti. Na, na iha, amhikama, nasa asti. There is no loss. Pratyavaya, no diminution, no harm, no bad effect, no opposition. Everything we do, victory or defeat, success or failure, gain or loss, it's all good because we learn. Because what is the thing that is never going to be lost? The Atman. The Atman is never going to be lost. So whatever we do in this world, in the form of our duty, performing our duty, um, uh, practicing the sadhana, the religious and spiritual and devotional sadhana, it's all to become better people. If we don't become better people, <laughs> is the point. Is that, is that clear? So, yes. Good. So the, the point is that our effort is to win the war, but it's not about winning the war, really. You know, it, it's about doing our duty properly. So if we build a big ashram and then we lose it, <laughs> talking about myself, you know, it's not a failure. You know, I've done my best. I, I invested the effort and everything, you know, for what? Not to possess some land or some building or some fame and name or whatever. No, to do my duty, my duty is, was, especially in that particular situation, to offer people the opportunity to engage in Dharma. That was my job. My job was not that to have, you know, to actually get people engaged in Dharma. Because I cannot decide for other people. I can only offer opportunities. So I believe that even that failure has been a great success. So I think that uh, now Jagannath is happy that I've done it. And, you know, <laughs> you, you, you tried enough and I'm not going to, uh, to try again because, yeah, well, you know, I did, I did my job, I did my best. And uh, let's see what next uh, Jagannath will uh, uh, want me to do. I'm ready. So um, this is the, 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 the point. We are liberated from the greatest fear, even by a little effort. What is the greatest fear? The greatest fear is ignorance, is material identification, material attachment, is a samsara. Like Adi Shankar was saying, Iha Samsare, Pahimura. We want to be protected from this samsara. Not from the samsara itself, but from the attachment to the samsara. What is the samsara? Samsara is a wheel of birth and death, but it's not uh, simply birth and death you know, the, the problem, because even a, a liberated soul can continue to take birth and, uh, and to leave the body, but there is no death, there is no birth, because, it, you know, Jivan Mukta doesn't identify with the body, so he, he is not born and he never dies. Like Krishna, you know, says uh, in, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, the Aja, Aja you know, uh, the, the Atman is never born and never dies. How is it possible? All the Jivatmas keep uh, getting born and, and dying. So what does Krishna mean? The Atman is never born and never dies because he's not identified with the body. So the greatest fear is the identification with the body that make us, makes us believe, you know, in the illusion that we are the body and we possess things, we belong to things. Ahankar and Mamatva. Is that clear? 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So we have uh, this uh, very interesting verse. Then we have 41, but we have still a few verses to go before the end of the second chapter. Uh, but um, I think we can close here. And uh, we start again next time from verse 41. Uh, okay. Because the second chapter deserves a lot of attention. Because the second chapter uh, is practically a summary of all the teachings <laughs> in the next chapters. It's an introduction. It's a brief presentation. It's like an abstract <laughs> of the whole Bhagavad Gita. So the last chapter will be the conclusion. So any any question, any obs you know, any comment, any anything now for this time? No, I think yeah, this forty-one verse is like when that next Buddhi Yoga part begins. So yeah, we can perfect. Like, uh, perfect. The Buddhi Yoga is. So all, all aspects related to it, we can cover it in one class. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So I hope you are happy with this uh, type of study session. Uh, if um, we can uh, make it better, you just uh, let me know, write down a list <laughs> of things. Also, if uh, uh, people who will see uh, this uh, video in... Um, uh, on YouTube, uh, they can uh, also, you know, write down questions. They can also participate. If they want to participate, they can write to me at the address, the email address that is on every, on the description box of every video, each video. Okay, so thank, thank you again for participating, and uh, we'll continue thank next time. Thank you for giving time. your valuable time. <laughs> exactly.